Every day, doctors give kids drugs that the U.S. government hasn't approved for use in children. It's called prescribing drugs off-label. It's perfectly legal. Still, it's a practice that concerns some doctors. As an individual, I am infuriated by this. Um, my colleagues in the business are infuriated by this. And there's not a day that goes by that, we don't, that I have to prescribe a drug that I know is being given off-label. So a drug that may be absolutely safe and usable in a two-year-old can in fact be quite dangerous in a one-day-old. Overall, doctors say that when they give kids drugs off-label, sometimes the results are unexpected. Take psychoactive drugs. I can remember an example of a, a young boy, maybe seven or eight, who uh, was just disinhibited and literally jumped out a second floor window. Now, scary. Fortunately, he didn't get hurt. And it... It, it makes me a bit uncomfortable to talk about these situations because, you know, I was prescribing the medicine, but we, um, you know, we had a medicine where we didn't have the data in kids about proper dosing, and we learned a bit by trial and error. That's why many doctors think it's essential for the government and pharmaceutical companies to study drugs in kids of all ages. The evidence speaks for itself. You need to take the most dynamic, developing, growing, changing organism, the most vulnerable organism, the child, the infant, and the adolescent, and you need to study them if you're going to know how to properly use these drugs. Diane Murphy is the government's point person for testing drugs in kids. Over the last decade, her agency has been working with Congress to require drug companies to do pediatric trials. The agency was asked to put together, back in the late 1990s, a list of products that would benefit from being studied in children. The list in 2000 had well over 400 products. We have now been able to get studied over 220 using both the BPCA and the PREA. You'd say, gee, you're halfway there. But you have to also remember that every year, anywhere from 20 to 30 new products are coming on the market. So in the last 10 years, we have about 200 <laughs> more products. So you say, oh, you're not making any products. That's not true either, because all those products don't need to be studied in kids. So she says her best guess is somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the drugs that need to be studied in kids have been. Still, she admits it's been frustrating. How could we end the 20th century and still not ha know how to use properly the products that were medicines that we're giving children. Well, because it's really hard and ethically you better make sure that you're asking a good question. And even with a good scientific question, studies with children are just different. Among the problems? Children can't give consent. Um, that's like a fundamental basis of how you do trials. You have to have um, a whole institution, if you will, or a group of people who are child-friendly. You have to have nurses who know how to deal with children. You have to have an area that's child-friendly and not frightening. And then when you get past all of that, you still have to deal with, do we have the right kind of instruments? Do we have the right kind of lab? Even with all these problems, researchers start several dozen pediatric trials each year. But trials can take years to finish. In the meantime, how are doctors supposed to know how to use these drugs in children? First, we can use pediatric dosing guidelines that have been put together by experts in pediatrics. Second, we can go with our own experience prescribing these medications or the experience of our colleagues. Or third, we can use adult dosing guidelines and try to understand from those guidelines what might be best for use in children. But even doctors who are prescribing drugs off-label are still grappling with whether they should tell parents. Some doctors have to. Absolutely. Uh, an important part of the informed consent process is being clear with the youngster and uh, the family about what we know and what we don't know and whether or not this medicine is formally approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Yes. We never discuss this issue with parents, interesting enough that the fact that the drug is used off-label is never discussed with a family. The interesting part of that is is that you would have to inform a patient if they were in a research study involving the drug, but in terms of the everyday use of the drug, 
It's not required, and I don't know anybody who does it. But surveys suggest most parents do want to know if doctors are prescribing drugs off-label. When we asked in our national poll on children's health, whose responsibility is it to let someone know, to let a parent know, whether a medication has FDA approval for use in children, over 90% of parents told us it's the doctor's responsibility. One problem is sometimes doctors don't know if they are prescribing drugs off-label. I don't believe that most of the pediatric community who prescribes medications know what drugs are labeled and what aren't labeled. To help doctors, the FDA has set up a website that tells them which drugs have been tested in children. Pharmaceutical companies say they're trying to find ways to get more drugs tested faster, and technology may help speed things up too. For example, one British company creates virtual clinical trials in virtual children. So modeling and simulation this in virtual children can provide guidance to the actual design of those real studies. But to work, the simulated child needs high-quality data from real studies. Well, obviously, if anything to do with computers, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. That data is being provided by industries, universities, nonprofits, and regulatory agencies. But they don't expect virtual trials to be perfect. I think there'll always be the need, obviously, for real experiments. It's a question of whether you can rationalize the numbers of those and the need for them in many cases. Are we doing too many? You know? So in the first instance, I think this approach of modeling and simulation will inform us as to whether a particular study is actually needed. And clearly, if we can show that the outcome is not likely to be significant, then this will save a lot of time and money. But all these efforts could get caught in legal limbo. That's because the U.S. law that requires pediatric trials runs out in 2012. I think these laws need to be finalized so we don't have to go back and ask Congress every five years to say, kids are important, would you please renew these laws? Many experts say it's unlikely that Congress will let the laws lapse, but they say the uncertainty is hard on everyone. It takes a village to raise a child. I, I think we're all responsible in some ways. Um, we as Physicians and clinicians need to be advocates. Um, we need to push for um, more good research data so that we uh, know that the drugs we're prescribing work and that they're safe. And, he says, parents, Congress, the FDA, and National Institutes of Health all play important roles, too. And, uh, finally, the pharmaceutical industry. They make the medicines, they market them, and uh, they have the resources to do the kinds of studies that can give us the information we need. Of course, there's a lot of competition for those resources. Companies can't just test old drugs. They need to develop new ones, too. And that's why Congress has created financial incentives for the pharmaceutical industry to test those drugs. Companies can get a longer patent on a drug if they test the drug in children. The question is, are those incentives enough to speed up the process? Congress will take another look in 2012. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.